also work at Historic England, and they're going to give an overview of some of the work that Historic England have, have been doing over the last 18 years. Morning, everyone. I, I feel like I should say, and now for something completely different after that incredibly moving session this morning. So um, I'm going to read my talk so that I don't overrun. So uh, today, Matt and I are going to talk about how our large area mapping projects have evolved since the time of the last UK ARG in 2006. I'll be setting the scene and explaining the context to our work, and Matt will be taking a deeper dive into the main step changes. So just to give a, a bit of background about myself and Matt, um, I've worked on, in various roles in aerial survey team at Historic England and its predecessors, uh, from 1992 until 2021, and that included for a while managing the programme of mapping projects. Uh, Matt joined the team in 2006, the time of the last ARG, um, although he was involved in aerial archaeology before that, and he has been the aerial survey team principal since 2021, and as Sally mentioned, she's the manager there as well. So if you have any questions, ask them. Okay. Although, although today we're going to be concentrating on the large area aerial survey projects, um, I just want to briefly mention the wider context for our work. Um, and this includes Historic England's role as the national public body that helps people care for, enjoy, uh, and celebrate the historic environment. And our aerial survey team is part of a multidisciplinary group of archaeologists and much of our site-based work is focused on scheduled monuments, so that's nationally legally protected sites, and English heritage sites, so those are sites that are open to the public. Um, but we've got a long history of carrying out and funding large area projects, many of them multidisciplinary, but we're mainly talking about our aerial focused work today. So the focus of the archaeological teams is discovery, recording, analysis, and presentation. Um, and this includes, as well as the teams in the area that I manage, um, we've got, that's the investigation teams that we've got some illustrations here. Um, we also have archaeological and environmental scientists who work alongside us on our projects. So in aerial survey, this work of discovery, et cetera, comes in two overlapping areas, our aerial reconnaissance program, and you're gonna hear from Damien and Robin about that later, um, and also through mapping, which obviously is the focus of this talk. And the QR code doesn't take you to a random shopping site. I promise it does take you to our research pages. Um, and I would encourage you to look at them because there's some amazing stuff in there that we can't cover today. Okay, so as many of the people in this room know, uh, our programme of work had its origins in the late 1980s, uh, with minimum standards established in the early 1990s. And Earlier ambitions for national coverage, hence the original name National Mapping Programme, evolved into what Pete Horn, hi Pete, um, described as a patchwork of project approach, um, uh, looking and targeting our work where we felt that our mapping was helped to address um, issues relating to understanding conservation and management of the historic environment. So very much with a focus on providing information for management purposes. And our fundamental approach has remained the same throughout. This won't be a surprise to lots of people here. And that's to make effective use of any, as many aerial sources as possible for use in strategic management and for research into the historic environment. And we do this by interpreting the information on multiple sources, collating this information by mapping the form extent of archeological remains, and that includes uh, remains seen above ground as earthworks, our structures, and below ground remains revealed as crop marks. Um, and in nine, the 1990s, that was not revolutionary, but it was quite unusual to look at things beyond crop marks. And there are still people out there who equate aerial archaeology with buried remains. Um, but obviously, we're looking at a lot more as we saw this morning. So, um, and once we've done these interpretations, we describe the site records and we provide landscape overviews and syntheses in reports. And well before 2006, our archaeological maps had evolved from hand-drawn overlays into a fully digital 
product. So if we fast forward to 2018, sorry, um, we felt it was time to review where we were from a technical perspective. And this was partly in the light of increasing availability and use of GIS, uh, plus the exponential growth in the volume and nature of both analog and digital aerial sources. And I think in the UK, we've always had a great wealth of sources available to us. And Matt's going to explore some of the implications of that later for these large area projects. So in 2018, Sally carried out a survey of users and producers of our project results. And you can see a couple of the quotes here and some of the, the people who have been using our data. And I think the results of this survey really underlined and confirmed the need for us to ensure that our information is suitable for use as a daily planning tool um, and local authorities, so that's the local government bodies who manage planning and management of the historic environment at a local level in the UK, uh, continue to be the main customer for our work. Um, and that, coming back to what people were saying earlier today about integrating data, so although the Mapping Explorer information you're seeing is just the aerial data, the idea is that our information goes into a historic environment record where there are, there are there's archaeological evidence from multiple sources, not just from aerial survey, from excavation, etc. Um, so that was all well and good. Um, but the 2018 survey also highlighted the need to make our information easier to get hold of um, and available to wider audiences. Um, and again, Matt's going to explore, explore this a bit more later. Um, and I should say that the data here is from the Aerial Archaeology Mapping Explorer. So this is data I've downloaded. Um, and squelched through our GIS and had a bit of a play with. So, as well as local authorities, we work with a wide range of partners in different contexts. Uh, and the main funding for the programme is from Historic England. Um, and this includes the work of our own team, plus we provide grants to fund partners in local authorities, commercial organisations and in universities. There's quite a few people in the audience. Um, today who have worked on projects with us. Um, we've also been supported financially and as project par partners by different organisations, uh, probably most significantly including the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So that's also public funding as well as our main funding. Um, and if you're interested in working with us, do come and talk to any of us. Um, as I say, there's quite a few of us here. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, our approach has developed from large county-based projects to smaller areas with more targeted outcomes, but we still cover substantial areas, and that's usually a minimum of 100 square kilometres and up to about maybe three or 400 square kilometres per project. And we found over the years that the projects of about a year to 18 months work best in terms of analysis and delivery, and frankly, for the sanity of the teams involved. Um, and the key, as I'm mentioning people, the key to the success of our programme, as in many things, are the people who carry out the work. Um, the skills and availability of people to effectively carry out large area uh, mapping projects are relatively rare in the UK, although I do realise that we are actually in a very fortunate position compared to a lot of other countries. Um, and it's the different perspectives of all these people who've worked with us um, that have helped us develop our approaches to the scope, methods, dissemination, and then the analyses of the archaeological remains that we're, we're finding. Um, and I, I would say one of the challenges is in managing the program over the years has been how we maintain that quorum of skilled people. Um, and as with everything else, this is mainly due to highly varying levels of funding. So, Although the focus of our talk is on our methods and approaches, I just want to briefly mention archaeological scope. And this is also expanded and adapted as archaeological research develops, but also in response to the different audiences for our information. So, for example, our work in urban areas, which was part of a government funded initiative called Heritage Action Zones, has started to influence our large area projects as well. Um, and the example up here. Um, from Scunthorpe, um, Alison Deegan included traditional approaches 
uh, while working with our heritage schools colleagues to provide photo essays and teaching resources based around the iron and steel works, which is a hugely significant local industry and part of the local heritage, and not least a threatened industry as well. Um, and another example is our latest project on the South Downs, where we further adapted our approaches to working with local communities. And Matt talked a bit about this last year, uh, last year's hour, I believe. Um, but in short, we've done things like including a GIS portal where volunteers can add their own information um, and experiences of archaeology in the area. And the report was written to inspire local communities to use the aerial survey information to carry out their own research. So it's about trying to engage people with their, with their the archaeology and heritage on their doorstep, which may not be immediately obvious. Um, and Sophie and Jack are going to be talking about some of these aspects in a little while. So this is the final one from me. Um, um, so the evolution of our work has led to what could be described as characterful data, which sort of links a little bit to the talk we were, uh, the discussion we were having earlier. And this is a term expressed by the Oxford University Landscapes and Identities Big Data Project. And this is a concept whereby you embrace that your data are shaped and influenced by the ways they are created, curated, and used. And I think when we were developing the Mapping Explorer, we got very hung up, and the diagram on the left is deliberately horrible, just to show you some of the many permutations when you're just looking at methods. Uh, you know, so we haven't even touched on uh, the variability of the archaeological information that's available to analyze in the Mapping Explorer. And again, Matt's going to talk a little bit more about that later. So our information, we've just embraced that our information has a varied character, but it represents a substantial and useful body of work um, and is there for anyone to use for their own research. Um, and as it turned out, for pleasure as well. We've had a lot of feedback when we launched the Mapping Explorer about how much fun it is looking at it. I mean, I know we're all perhaps aerial nerds here, um, but it's something that I still enjoy. You know, if I go anywhere, I have a look at what we've got, if we've got something on Mapping Explorer. Um, and this for me, um, someone with origins in the analog age, um, and some colleagues here will remember that we had to collate things, bits of paper stuck together, all sorts of things, the move into the digital age and collating it all in this one place. And this has been one of the greatest achievements, I think, of the aerial survey team in the last 18 years. Um, and this is in large part thanks to Simon Crutchley and Sally Evans, who uh, respectively manage under the bonnet and the delivery of the product, along with all our colleagues as well. Um, so I just a final thought to repeat what I said earlier. I mean, personally, for me, it's been the range of different people that I've worked with over the years have made working in aerial surveys so special and continues to be. And that's past and current colleagues, all our placements, and all the people who've worked with us on our projects. And on that cheery note, I shall pass over to Matt, who's going to delve into the data. I, I, I don't know whether that was applause for Helen leaving or me coming, so we'll be we'll, we'll there. All right, fantastic. Um, so, um, as Helen um, has indicated, oh, happy, okay. Um, as Helen has indicated, um, since 2006, we've added a significant um, amount of data um, to the national picture. So over 29,000 square kilometers um, of mapping since 2018, um, meaning that we've now, now got over 50% of, uh, of the country covered. Um, one of the most significant developments in that period, of course, has been this, this revolution in the, the amount of digital data that we're handling. Um, I won't go into that in particular detail, but you can see from the the right-hand side of the screen, the amount of um, the amount of sources that we were having to deal with in 2006, compared to the number of sources that we're dealing with in 2024. Um, the graphs on the left-hand side of the screen were taken from Sunny's report, and these show actually quite an interesting picture. Um, we can see that the overall headline is that it is actually taking us longer to do the mapping process than it used to if we look at the days per square kilometre. Um, but what's very interesting from the graphs below is that it basically shows that we're finding a huge amount more stuff, and we're also getting much more efficient at recording that stuff. So the net effect is that it is taking longer, um, but we've, we're getting plenty of bang from, from our book. 
Um, some of the new sources that we've been dealing with um, are just having, you know, the, the effect of incremental gains. Essentially, you know, if, you, if you've got more period of auto photography, there's a higher probability that you're going to come across some auto photography that's taken at a good time to record crop marks, for example. Um, but some have more, more radically altered our understanding. I think over the past 18 years, um, by far the biggest impact has been the widespread um, free availability of um, LIDAR data, which is now national coverage at one meter. Um, just in, by way of illustration of this, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, this is one square kilometre from the Hadrian's Wall National Mapping Project that we, we completed around about 2009. Um, so all of the features that you see on that were taken from 18 individual sources, so that's 18 rectifications. Pretty much all of that is visible on the LIDAR data because this is a, an area where there's been very, very little landscape change over the past few decades. Um, and the, the eagle-eyed amongst you might even spot bits that are visited on the LIDAR that we didn't have access to at the time. Um, LIDAR has also been very, very, um, very, very useful in areas where we wouldn't necessarily have expected it to give good returns. Um, so around Cambridge here, for example, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen these very broad, very, very low boundary banks that are cropping up in a landscape that's been very, very uh, heavily plowed for quite a number of decades. And uh, you can see our, our mapping on the top there, but illustrating that the LIDAR only provides you know, one part of that picture because all of the other stories that you can see there are things like top marks that have come from um, oblique photography and vertical photography. So our additional sources are still very, very key. Cool. Um, very commonly, our projects are known to um, increase the historic environment record by um, up to uh, 70%. Um, but in some areas, this can actually be a much more significant um, impact. So the boundary banks that we saw before are just part of a much broader picture that we can trace across large areas of Cambridgeshire and Bedfordshire. Um, the Cambridgeshire project, one of the drivers behind that was the huge amount of development pressure that there is in this particular area. Um, in other areas, we're coming across different kinds of pressures. So with the, the climate crisis that we're encountering, um, things like rewilding schemes, um, are, are some of the things that we can address through um, aerial archaeology. Um, so this is uh, something that, uh, once again, Sophie and Jack will be covering a little bit later, but this is just an excerpt from one of our projects in Norfolk, where a large landscape um, uh, nature recovery scheme um, is, is partially um, encompassed in one of the drivers for one of our large area aerial investigation and mapping projects. Um, so just looking at uh, some of the numbers, um, Helen's already alluded to the, the fact that we have our public portals. Um, so we know from our market intelligence that the aerial mapping products is very, very valued um, as a product. Um, but historically, the kind of complexity and the size of the data made it actually very, very difficult to disseminate effectively. And once again, the digital resolution um, with the, you know, the development of GIS, particularly things like the Esri online portals, has enabled us to share this data much more effectively. Um, so we've just got a few numbers on the screen there that I, I won't necessarily dwell on, but it's essentially people are very, very engaged with our products. They're, very, they're using our products. The two very interesting ones um, on the right -hand, bottom right-hand side of the screen, those are the figures for the Aerial Archaeology Mapping Explorer. Um, so over the last 12 months, um, we're looking at around about 14,000 page views. Um, a big philosophical change over the past couple of years has been the decision to make all of our data um, under an open government license. And um, you can see that the impact of this um, over the past 12 months, 3.4 million requests um, for that particular data. Um, so our methodology continues to involve some of these as small incremental changes. So something like the uh, RVT plugins uh, are significantly um, making our, our workflow much more efficient. Kind of things that we're looking at in the future is how we can maybe build our, um, artificial intelligence into that workflow um, with that, that kind of human, human in the loop um, methodology. Um, so just finally, um, to conclude then, so we can see that the, the fundamental principles behind the, what was the National Mapping Programme is still very relevant and varied. And it still really is the most cost-efficient um, way to record um, archaeology at scale. Our product is very, very um, valued, and demand is very high. And uh, as Helen's also alluded to, a very, very good way for um, in, in, um, in, uh, engaging communities 
Um, but the big area is that there's a huge amount of untapped potential in our data. So do, do click and download and start playing with it. It's completely free. That's it from us. <laughs>